Thank you for joining us in another Finding God in the World of Video Games Rewind. And today I want to start with a quick exercise. If you're currently playing through a video game, raise your hand. Probably everyone's hands up right now. If you're also playing through another game simultaneously, raise your other hand. Now, if in addition to those two games, you have yet another game in the queue that you are still messing around with, please raise one more hand. Finally, if those games are on different video game platforms, Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, raise one more hand. So, sweet. I have finally identified the number of extraterrestrial readers I have, and I can finally scratch that off the old bucket list. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably have a few different games in rotation right now. I have one game I am actively playing through, another game that I'm in the early exploratory stages of, yet another game that I like to play online with my friends, hopefully once a week, and then there's my Switch that can jump into the rotation at any given moment. Now that is not to mention the myriad of games that I was really enjoying, but moved on from because something new, bright, and shiny distracted me. By the way, if you were still doing it, you can put your hands down now. Did you really still have them up? Come on, man. Now, I know this may come as a surprise to those of you who maybe know me personally, but I only have one brain. I know, I know. Please contain your gasp of shock and horror. Now, while my demeanor may indicate I know exactly what I'm doing and where I am going, the truth is that my thoughts are typically stuck somewhere between trying to remember random pro wrestling facts and deciding if I still want tacos for dinner. The problem I find myself running into is that I have a limited bandwidth on the information I can retain on each of these games that I'm playing. Some of those things are fairly important, you know, like what the buttons actually do, or where I was going to go next. Many times, if it's been a little while between sessions, I start the game up only to remember that the reason I put the game down in the first place is because I was stuck. And now I can't even remember what I was stuck on, what exactly I was trying to do that got me stuck, and every time I think I am pushing the jump button, I end up throwing a grenade because I forgot what I was doing here and what each button does. And also, let me tell you something. The grenade that I threw right next to me usually doesn't help the situation, not even a little bit. Now obviously, these are self-inflicted wounds. I could probably be patient and play one game at a time, and only move on to the next game when I'm finished with what I picked up originally. But that's kind of like going to Baskin Robbins and only sampling one flavor. I mean, I know which one I want, but that doesn't mean I don't want to try a few other flavors out as well, just in case one of them becomes my new favorite. The unintended outcome of playing all of these different games simultaneously is I become less skilled at each of them, because I refuse to focus on just one at a time. I spend the first 20 minutes of the game just trying to get my bearings, figuring out what the buttons do, remembering how to use the map, and then somewhere in the middle of that it's time to feed the baby, where I remember I need to take the trash out, or I come to the realization that those tacos for dinner are not going to make themselves. See what I did there? I brought the, the tacos back into it, for continuity's sake. While playing video games, there's definitely a drop in my performance as I ease my way back into a game while bouncing back and forth between multiple titles. Elite gamers, especially if they play on the eSports circuit, typically restrain themselves to very few game choices so they can train their reflexes and become the very best at their game of choice. Interjecting other titles can cause a momentary lag in the decision-making process, and that split second where you're not allowing your muscle memory to make the decision for you can be the difference between winning and losing. So even though there are a whole lot of great games out there to play, these dedicated gamers restrain themselves to mastering a few select titles so they can compete at the highest levels. The same lack of restraint that I struggle with in my gaming is present in my day-to-day -day life as well. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, let's see, how many things can I be terrible at today? But yet many times I still find my way there. Not because I lack the right intentions, or even because of my limited capabilities, but because I am a man divided across too many different battlefields. All of these competing priorities cause mental congestion, and instead of delivering on who I want to be, I find more often than not, I provide a very watered-down version of myself across each goal. In James 1.8, there is an excellent piece of wisdom, and while there is definitely an appropriate context to the statement that we'll hit at the end, I think this sentence also just stands alone really well. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, many of us battle with being of two minds more often than we care to admit. Not necessarily two opposing views simultaneously in the same brain, but simply a division of your resources across competing fronts. We want to get into peak physical shape, but we also want to excel at our work and school objectives. We want healthy relationships with our loved ones, but we also want to invest into our passions. 
We know we need to place God at the center of all we do, but in reality, we often provide Him with only the time we have left over after we exhausted ourselves with all those other priorities in life. And don't forget about those tacos, you still gotta make those. So what is the solution to the double-minded epidemic that only seems to get worse the more we try to simplify our lives? So now it's time to finally fully investigate the context around this concept of being double-minded. You see that in the entirety of James 1, 5 through 8, as he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all, liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For not let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So let's unpack that just a little bit. The reason we are double-minded is not necessarily because we want different things or even the wrong things. It's because we think we are responsible for all of these outcomes ourselves without the Lord's involvement. God is not requiring us to be wise. He is telling us to ask Him for His wisdom so He can guide our paths, as you see in Proverbs 3, six. Saying a prayer to God once you are already halfway to your destination or at the end of your decision-making process makes zero sense. But more importantly, it illustrates a lack of actual faith that He will provide a response or guidance. And if we are simply praying as a matter of form or function, instead of with an actual belief that He is here to guide our path, then we are truly the most unstable of all of God's creation. We cannot achieve success in any area when our paths are not centered on receiving His wisdom first. Let's look at this very practically. Clearly, we all have responsibilities in life, people who depend on us in a variety of ways, and the basics of self-preservation to attend to. All of these things are necessary, God-ordained and good. But when we try to do any of these things without allowing God to direct, guide, and provide, we are demonstrating a dangerous split in our psyche. We are simultaneously acknowledging His priorities for us without actually permitting Him to be involved with the execution of it. God placed it in our hearts to be providers, nurturers, friends, hard workers, and so much more. But when we pursue each of these without His overarching wisdom to guide us, we are doomed to frantically chase one objective after another and exhaust ourselves in the pursuit of each. Think about Jesus for a moment. He was sent here with the largest mission that any human has ever carried, the heaviest burden, the responsibility to lead a flawless, sinless life, and then save the entire human race with his sacrifice. No matter how challenging your particular situation is, I'm pretty comfortable with the knowledge that he has all of us beat in that department. But as you read through the New Testament, I found something remarkably consistent with Jesus. He never demonstrated stress, he never seemed in a hurry, and he never showed panic. He had the largest, most complicated mission any of us will ever carry, and yet he never seemed the least bit concerned with his ability to deliver on it. He was the very definition of single-minded, and there's a reason for that. Let's go through some of these verses, and you let me know when you sense a theme. Mark 1.35 In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out, departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Matthew 14, 23. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Luke 6, 12. It came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And then, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It seems to me there's a simple cure for the double-minded syndrome. It's in allowing our easily distracted and compromised mind to become one with the mind of God. And how do we do that? How do we rise above the stress, the anxiety, the fear, the panic, and the continuing realization that we still have not started making that taco dinner yet? One way, and one way only, through seeking God's wisdom in prayer. If Jesus seemed to think it was important, then I have an important news flash for you. It probably is. He had a whole lot to do and a very short amount of time to do it and a whole lot of prophecies to fulfill, but he never allowed those seemingly competing priorities have a single opportunity to alter the wisdom he had received from the Father each and every day. If you feel overwhelmed with your seemingly endless parade of responsibilities and goals and are growing frustrated with an ever-decreasing capacity to achieve them, 
then this was for you. There is a false belief that I have heard many well-meaning people and even a lot of believers say, God will never put on you more than you're able to bear. Well, I have some pretty bad news for you. That is not a verse in the Bible. Not any Bible. Not even those random weird translations that you can get by sending in three proofs of purchase from specially marked boxes of Frosted Flakes cereal. The verse is simply not in there. That concept is a gross misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 10.13. I encourage you to study it when you have time to see for yourself. The truth is God will absolutely give us more than we can bear because we are never meant to carry it alone. We simply cannot do what God placed us here on earth to do without him. Not in some existential sense, but in a very real, very present, very intentional way. Only through consciously involving him in our daily life through constant prayer and seeking his wisdom for all of life's many challenges and questions can we have a singular mind in which everything he has placed in our hearts to do becomes achievable. Not because he gives us more hours in the day or makes magical tacos appear in the kitchen, but because the little that we have becomes much in his hands. When I try to apply my already limited gaming skills across multiple different titles and styles in a short period of time, I am doomed to struggle in each of them. And not only am I wildly unsuccessful, but I also don't really enjoy the experience. It kind of defeats the purpose of playing games in the first place. Similarly, when we fail to make God an ever-present part of all of our decisions, plans, and daily actions, we are choosing the most difficult, least enjoyable, and least successful path to the finish line. Single-mindedness only comes from aligning our minds through prayer with the mind of our Creator, never the other way around.